I'm Connor Rebush, and if you are interested in the finer points of face punching, you've come to the right place. This is Heavy Hands. Welcome to another episode of Heavy Hands. I am your host, Connor Rebush. With me is Dr. Patrick Wyman, my intrepid co-host. And today, well, as is probably going to be the case for the next uh, two weeks or so, we just have a lot of fights to discuss. And um, that's what we're doing. Uh, we have, of course, a wonderful fight event that just happened. Chan Sung Jung, 42 months out of the sport came back in Dominic Cruz-esque fashion to knock out Dennis Bermudez in the first round after, in classic zombie fashion, absorbing a few shots straight to the chin. That was wonderful to see. It was also wonderful to see the Korean zombie tweeting at Dominic Cruz and telling him that he was an inspiration because, uh, you know, only two guys I can think of who have defied ring rust so spectacularly. But, of course, we have a card next week as well that we are going to start today's discussion with that is main evented by the inaugural UFC Women's Featherweight Championship bout between former bantamweight champion Holly Holm and uh, former mid-tier bantamweight Jermaine Durandamy. It's a division that was, uh, for all intents and purposes, created for Chris Cyborg, and now Cyborg doesn't want to cooperate with the UFC's um, expectations for camp time, and the UFC doesn't want to cooperate with her expectations. And, of course, Cyborg may have recently popped for another performance-enhancing drug. So God only knows what's going on and why this featherweight title fight is still going through, and we don't get a flyweight division like we've all been asking for, or even an atomweight division. But here we are, women's featherweight... Frankly. Well, it's because the UFC thinks that every card has to be headlined by a title fight. I guess, yeah. That's, so that's why we're still getting it. Though, I think the instinct to just give Cyborg a title and let her beat the shit out of somebody every now and again is not a bad one. No. But, like, I think that's fine. Though, you know, we've talked about things like this before, but there is just not enough talent at 145 no. pounds to sustain a women's featherweight division. It does not exist. 145 for women is like middleweight for men. It's getting to that point where you're not having as many very good athletes. You know what I'd I mean? Say, I'd say it's even closer to I'd say it's closer to heavyweight in terms of the sheer amount of talent that's available. I think women's bantamweight is like middleweight. Have you seen women's heavyweight? I uh, that's <laughs> like you're talking about super heavyweight. It's not. It's a platform. freak show. It's not even. It's not even really a fighting division. Uh, but anyway, we've, I mean, we got the fight. We can talk about the political reasons behind it. We can talk about our discontent with the existence of the division some more as we get into this. But the fight itself is pretty interesting. Holly Holm versus Jermaine Durandamy is essentially, unless someone comes in and tries to surprise the other, a kickboxing bout. One of the purest examples of just a kickboxing match I've actually seen in MMA, where the two fighters are both constantly fighting people they must both be constantly annoyed that their opponents want to take them down. And now neither of them will probably try to. Uh, so we're going to talk about that in just a minute. Let me run through with the rest of what we're doing, give you a little table of contents before we dive in. We're also going to talk about, of course, the middleweight bout between Anderson Silva and Derek Brunson. We're going to talk about the light heavyweight bout between Glover Teixeira and Jared Cannonier. And we're going to talk about welterweight looking for a fight prospect Randy Brown, who takes on Bilal Muhammad on short notice. Then we're going to talk about, uh, you know, we're going to recap all of our favorite moments from, whew, is that Lucy squeaking something in the background? Yeah, Lucy, Lucy has found a toy that I think is the most annoying goddamn thing on the face of the planet. And she was too riled up for me to be able to catch her and put her in the kitchen before we started recording. <laughs> so it's just just losses all around that. I swear to God, I, it's, it's fucking dog. OK, sorry. Sorry. Continue. You're good. We're going to talk about a few of our favorite fights from UFC Fight Night 104, including, of course, the Korean Zombies defeat of Dennis Bermudez, but also Alexa Grasso's surprisingly disappointing performance against Felice Herrig and Jessica Andrade versus Angela Hill, a banner fight for the women's strawweight division. So uh, all of that, probably some more as we get into it. Let's go ahead and start, as promised, with the women's featherweight championship, Holly Holm versus Jermaine Durandamy. Um, do you think... This is a good move for Holly Holm. 
Yes, I do. Because I think the public profile that she's built for herself at this point, she needs to be in big fights. And having lost two fights in a row at 135 pounds, this is the biggest fight available for her. You know, it's a headlining spot. She probably wasn't going to get another headlining spot otherwise. It's a good fight. I think she, I mean, I think she would have fought Chris Cyborg at 145 too. I think that that would have been a fight that she took. Like, she needs to keep her name out there. So from that perspective, yes. Now, if we're talking about matchup perspective, I think this is a terrible matchup for her. I could, a I could. god-awful matchup for her. That doesn't mean that she won't win, but I, I think it's a really bad kind of on-paper stylistic matchup. Yeah, well, before you get to be the bearer of bad news, let's just start the discussion with me saying that I think Holly will lose this fight. I actually think Jermaine Durandamy will beat her. And My tentative pick is also for Durand and me, but I'm willing, if somebody has a really strong for home opinion, I could maybe be talked into it. If there's yeah, an argument. I mean, there are things that make me, I mean, uh, for example, Mike Winklejohn talking in a recent interview about how he shouldn't have let Holly take her last fight uh, because she was apparently going through a lot of things in her personal life. And perhaps that affected how she looked against Valentina Shevchenko. That's possible. Uh, it's possible. She looked, she was certainly not able to adapt to what Valentina was bringing to the table. Um, now, whether that's just a factor of the limitations of her style, which I think in part it was, uh, but it could have also had a, been affected by her mental state. So that's a possibility that maybe she will look refreshed and, and more eager to fight this time and not so lost. But uh, why don't we get into this by talking about just Holly Holmes' style, uh, what, what it's good at and what it's not good at. Uh, I've, I've talked in the past and, and written articles about the reason that she can't punch hard. Um, but I think it, it, her positioning affects a lot more than just punching power. And when I talk about positioning, I mean the fact that Holly tends to approach fights by uh, or her stance is pretty much locked into one position. She's leaned forward over her lead foot. In her case, it's her right foot because she's a southpaw. Her weight is almost entirely on that foot. I'd say it looks to me about 70, 30, 80, 20 weight on the front foot. And that is her basic position. She has to move her feet uh, to pull her head out of range because she is not really comfortable pulling her head back over her back foot. She seems very stiffly in that position. And the problem with that is that it gives you no room for your upper body to move forward. And so it's difficult to close distance um, in a surprising way. And that was certainly a problem against Shevchenko, who just casually stepped back every time Holmes stepped in. And it also means you cannot transfer weight forward. So your cross, which for a southpaw, that left cross is usually the crucial weapon, is never going to have any power on it. You are already in the end position of a cross, so it, it can only be an arm punch. And these are problems that Holmes has worked around rather than worked with um, and improved basically throughout her entire career, including the decade that she spent as a, as a pro boxer. I don't really disagree with any of that. I think Holmes game. Well, li like, let's take a step back and, and not focus on the technique so much as what is Holm actually trying to do? Holm is an outside striker. That's what she wants to do. She wants to set a long distance and then she wants to play with that distance in one of two ways. She's going to stick you so far outside using her kick using her kicking game mostly in MMA. She likes uh, she likes a lot of side kicks. She likes mm -hmm. round kicks. She likes front kicks. That's or she likes oblique kicks, all of those kicks. She's going to try and stick you a long way outside. And then either you're going to have to rush in to cover that distance or she can rush in with blitzing combinations. She probably prefers she's I think she prefers the latter. I think she likes blitzing combinations. I think she's better at the former. I think she's better when you come to her. Yes. So that's that's kind of what she wants to do. She wants to set a long range and then manipulate it. Someone she wants but, someone to plod after her rather than really pressuring her. I think she's fine if somebody wants to you know what, really yeah. like barrel down on her. I think no she's one, okay with that. No one really has done it in the UFC that I can think Just of. Just Rousey. Yeah, and Rousey, Rousey really barreled after her. <laughs> yeah, and Rousey was really bad at it. So yeah, I think you uh I think you may be correct, Pat. In fact, I think you are correct. Pressuring whether you're good at it or bad at it, I think that is why when home is at our most effective. Um but the, the reason the re for most fighters I don't immediately start talking about technique. Like the really specific details of how they hold themselves, how they throw their punches. For home, I do because I think it really dictates more than any other fighter I can think of at the moment uh, when she is effective and when she is not. Uh, it yeah. really, really places some hard limits 
on how her style can actually work. And that's why, specifically because of the way her technique is, uh, that's why she's better when people come after her. Because it actually allows her to put a little power in her shots. You know, it allows her to walk people into things, and that takes away from the need to actually put weight into them. Yeah, because when somebody is walking toward her, she has time to pull her weight back and then throw her cross like an actual cross instead of lunging forward right. into it. And even and if you're walking forward, even if I just hold my hand out with no momentum behind it, you're still going to hurt yourself walking into my fist. So just just the forward momentum of the opponent alone, that inertia makes it so that even her worst punches are about twice as effective as they are if the other person's trying to get away from them. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's like every time she lands when somebody is moving away from her, she catches them right at the end of the punch yeah. effectively yes. rather than at the kind of snapping point 80 percent into it where you've still got some room to drive through mm -hmm. and get actual power on it. Holm is always throwing as if you're at the very end. Yeah. So now for most of her career, though, though Holm has gotten away with this because she's an awesome athlete. She's a really, really good athlete. Yeah. She's Despite that weird stance and weird positioning, she's really explosive. She moves very quickly. She has she has kind of natural strength. She's got a great frame. She's got a lot of leverage. Like she's she is very a very well built for a fighter. Like broad shoulders, uh, mm -hmm. strong back. She's very powerful. She's a natural clinch fighter in MMA. Even though uh, she wasn't really a clinch fighter all that. I mean, she did some punch and clutch stuff, but it's a skill set that she developed pretty much entirely for MMA. Uh, but she was able to compete with Ronda Rousey in the clinch without much issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, she got thrown around a little bit by Valentina Shevchenko. I just think that's mostly because she wasn't expecting it. Yeah, she just got is... surprised. I mean, she was still she was still controlling Shevchenko in the clinch using her size. She just Shevchenko's a very crafty uh, Muay Thai trip artist. So, yeah, yeah. She also has, uh, apparently Shevchenko also has some kind of background in freestyle wrestling in addition mm. to all of her other stuff. Like, well, there you go. Uh, which is crazy. So, but enough of Shevchenko. We've talked a lot about her recently. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Holm is a very gifted physical specimen. And that has, in some ways, made the limitations of her actual technical style somewhat less glaring than they would be otherwise. Because she doesn't really jab all that much. Even in, if you go back and watch her boxing fights, she still didn't jab that much. It was mostly the left hand and kind of blitzing left, right, left, right, left, right combinations. Mm -hmm. We don't even see the right hand very often in MMA. Yeah, it's basically no, we don't. kicks in the left hand. Yeah, and she yeah, and it's usually a shifting right hand because she has to throw her weight forward into the left hand first. Um, yeah, you're right, it, but it's her athleticism, strength, uh, speed. Also, just uh, she has built a nice framework for her style. The strategic way that she approaches fights is pretty much pour on volume. Ooh, that was a heavy pop. Uh, pour on volume and. Do not slow down at any point in the fight. You know, she may have lost to Valentina Shevchenko, but it doesn't change the fact that she threw more punches in the fifth round than she had any other round of that fight. She's very yeah, well conditioned, and she uses that to her advantage. Now, even in a fight where maybe she wasn't in quite as good a shape as we've seen her in before, she was still easily able to fight hard for 25 minutes. Oh, yeah. She threw 78 punches in the fifth round alone. Yeah, that's a tremendous volume, yeah. especially for that late in a fight. So, like... This is these are not really knocks on Holly Holm. This is just kind of the nature of who Holm is as a fighter and how her game works. Like she's she's a very talented and well put together fighter. And when she can get her kicks and punches moving together, I think when she combines effectively her left straight and her left round kick, she can actually be kind of devastating because she does a good job of knowing if not throwing the cross in a way that we would think of as perfectly technical. She does a fantastic job of knowing what the cross does for her yes. and what else it opens up. Right. Yes. So she, she does understands a fantastic her job. Game. I'm sorry. She understands her game. I think that's what I was trying to yeah. get at. Like, I mm -hmm. think she understands what what her her mechanics allow her to do and not do. Yeah, exactly. And when she when she goes left straight to left kick, when she mixes up her left round kick to the legs, the body, the head, when she moves her when she moves her cross around, when she uses that to manipulate her opponent's hand positioning and head positioning. She can she can be a finisher. She's devastating in those regards. Yep. Like she picks and chooses her shots pretty well, generally speaking, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and and her footwork, I don't think it's great as she's moving forward. But if her opponent is coming after her, I think she has genuinely outstanding footwork. Like yeah. she has great pivots, great turns, um, very efficient when her opponent's coming after her. A good sense of where she is in the cage. Like very like you said, very smart, very intelligent, mm -hmm. knows what she's doing. Yes. Yeah. So so in a matchup against Jermaine Durandamy, why would we both pick Jermaine Durandamy? Um, for me, 
those technical limitations and the fact that I think Jermaine, Jermaine Deronomy is going to fight her in a manner somewhat similar to Valentina Shevchenko. Um, pro- well, you know, not as cautious, but she's going to prefer a striking match. And ironically, I think somebody who is comp- confident in striking with Holly Holm at long range, despite her boxing career, is probably the worst kind of person she can fight in MMA. And Jermaine Durandamy is not just uh, a solid striker. I mean, she's always been very competent Muay Thai, uh, Muay Thai kickboxer in the octagon. She's just had no grappling game, and that has been her downfall in, in all three of her losses. But she's always been a competent striker, and, and more than that, She's also very long and tall. I think she has an inch, two inches of height and an inch reach advantage on Holly Holm. And that's not a sort of frame that Holly has had to face before. In I mean, even when Shevchenko was giving her problems, Shevchenko is substantially smaller than Holly in that fight. Uh, yeah, that so, was basically, Holm boxed at 147, correct? I think so, yeah. Yeah, so that was basically somebody who used to box at 147 and who wasn't small for that particular weight class, fighting a natural flyweight. Yeah, fighting a, what would have been, yeah, for her, a, a lightweight in boxing. Mm-hmm. So yeah. so that's worth bearing in mind there. Yeah, there's there's a substantial, uh, this is one of the first times where Holm will have to outfight, because I, I think Durandamy by nature is also an outside fighter. I think that's where yeah. she's most comfortable is working at long range, working behind her jab. She's got an excellent jab, a really mm-hmm. strong piercing jab. She throws a great uh, great right hand, really kind of a meat and potatoes game. It's basically jab, jab cross, jab uppercut, the occasional round kick, and then work in the clinch. That's really what, what Durandamy does. It's a very basic kind of straightforward game. But because of its technical soundness, because of what underlies it, really outstanding footwork. Like, Durandamy has some of the best footwork in that division. Yeah. Really, really, really good footwork. She's always over her feet when she throws. She pulls her head off the center line as she throws to make herself hard to counter. Um, really strong command of distance, of the minutiae of distance, of like an inch here, an inch there. She never moves more than she has to. Very efficient. That's a kind of a tough game for somebody like Holm to deal with. Yeah, it's the Durandamy is she's not really a mixed martial artist. That's been her fault, her drawback. But the reason that she feels like a mediocre bantamweight is only because she's not much of a mixed martial artist. As a kickboxer, she's very, very sound. I agree. Um, and so somebody who can fight the type of fight Holm wants while while being able to take the shots that Holm throws and delivering shots that Holm may not be able to take that well. Uh, or that will at least have more of an impact than Holly's shots. Somebody who probably won't be surprised by her kicks uh, behind her, the kicks behind her punches, the way uh, Holly's other past opponents have been. I'm I'm not a hundred percent certain how Holly wins that fight unless it's by pouring it on. But the problem is, is that in that Shevchenko fight, Holly did pour it on, as I said, and I don't know. I I, I don't think I've ever seen a boxer struggle to find their range as much as Holly Holm does when her opponent just doesn't come after her. Mm-hmm. Uh, she, she, she whiffed a ton in that Valentina Shevchenko fight. I mean, we're talking, she, she's always whiffed a ton. Though. Yeah. That's look yeah. back at her fight with Raquel Pennington, uh, her sure, fight yeah. with Marion Renault. She whiffed a lot. She just shouts and throws a lot of volume out in the air, but because I, and again, I think it really comes down to technique. Um, on the one hand, she doesn't have much of a jab, but I don't think she's in a position to to reach out and paw and discover her distance because her upper body is at the limit of how far it can go forward. So she has no more room to cover. You know, she she has no more. Uh, the only way she can move forward is to move her feet. And uh, here's a little, a little historical reference for you. George Silver uh, was a fencer of the English school back in, I think, the 17th century. George Silver talked about the three times that you can use when you fight. He talked about the time of the hand, the time of the head, and the time of the foot. And it's basically that the hand moves faster than the head, uh, the body, more or less, bo- upper body movement. The body moves faster than the feet. Um, so if every attack initiates with the feet, your opponent is going to see it coming. They're going to make you whiff uh, if they're a good enough striker, you know, if they know what to, how to respond. Shevchenko knew how to respond. And so every single time that Holm had to step in and move her feet, the slowest part of her body, to strike, Shevchenko had no difficulty in seeing it coming. And I have difficulty seeing how it's going to be much different with Jermaine Durandamy. Yeah, I I agree with that. I agree with that. The kind of thing that 
I wonder about in a matchup like this, though, and I want to leave aside the technical stuff just for a minute, mm -hmm. is levels, you know? That Holly Holm, when she's lost, it has been to the very best fighters in the sport. Yeah. She lost to Misha Tate, who, for all of her flaws as a technician, for her, despite her lack of, like, top-end physical ability, has always been an elite thinker in the cage, mm -hmm. and it took Tate five rounds to figure out how to beat Holly Holm. Misha Tate you know? with desire in her heart is not an easy fight for anyone. Yeah, I mean, Tate is, by any metric, one of the very best women's bantamweights of all time, yeah. and, it, and she managed to figure out in kind of a desperation thing in a fight she was losing how to beat Holm with a slick move, like yeah. a, a rear <laughs> a, a, a faked takedown to a, a spin to the back to the rear waist lock to a back take to an immediate choke yeah. like that's what it took for tate to figure out how to beat home um it was striking with valentina shevchenko one of the very best strikers in women's mma if not the best striker in women's mma for five rounds in a competitive fight it was still a competitive fight even if home soundly lost large chunks of it it was still competitive she was still in that fight yeah Jermaine Durand to me, her, we look at her two fight winning streak and it's Larissa Pacheco and Anna Elmos who is now just straw got, weight. yeah. And, and who has, and who lost at straw weight yeah. to the immortal Amanda Bobby Cooper. So <laughs> like that's, th those are my concerns. And who was, and who was Durand to previous win in the UFC? Oh, it was, it was Julie Kedzie. Who's a very good fighter. Yeah. Um, in a close competitive fight. It was a split decision. And it was also Julie Kedzie near the end of her run when she also had a pretty unimpressive performance against Betch Cohea around that time. Yeah, Julie, so, I I actually, was... so I actually reached out to Julie and I asked her what she remembered about fighting to randomly. I was curious. So hmm. for our listeners, I thought like, you know, I'll try and get some ex some additional perspective on this. And what she remembered about to randomly is how good her footwork is. She's got really good, really precise footwork. Um, she remembered her balance, like how balanced Durandamy is over her feet at all times, um, how hard her right hand is, a really vicious right hand and mm -hmm. accurate with it, um, and how hard her knees are in the clinch. Those were those were Kedzie's impressions because I just figured, you know, like if we can if we can ask, we might as well ask. So that was what she thought of her. But that was still a competitive fight. Kedzie was in that fight yeah. for all three rounds. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, the, the, the levels may be may in fact, you know, Jermaine Durandamy has that style, but she's also... She's even even in, in her pre MMA career, probably didn't experience the kind of competition Holly Holm has has experienced throughout her career. Not that uh, women's welterweight in boxing is a fantastic division full of talent, but you know what 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 it, how good is European women's Muay Thai at welterweight? You know what I mean? It not, yeah. not in Thailand um, is Muay Thai is already unless you're you're in France or. The UK, there are not many great Muay Thai fighters, not from Thailand, and the competitions, all of the like IKA or whatever world kickboxing competitions for Muay Thai, they are really not respected in the world of Muay Thai because they don't really mean much. So 37-0 and 0 as a kickboxer looks really good, but we don't really know the quality of Durandami's competition. Yeah, it's really, really hard to say. So that's th those are kind of my concerns here is like, I think from a technical perspective, Durand to me should win this. I think that she has the tools to fight effectively with Holm at distance. She's not going to rush after her. If she chooses to stock Holm down, it won't be in such a way that she's going to run herself onto Holm's punches. Yeah. And and if it does get into the clinch, like we talked about Holm as a natural clinch fighter, but Durand to me, as good as she is at range, is probably even better when yeah. she's in the clinch throwing knees at you. So yeah. And where Holly is more of a smotherer and controller in the clinch, Durand to me likes to throw heat she throws some very vicious knees in, the, in that short range yeah so those are like from a, it, I think either way I, I keep getting in my head about this because I think <laughs> I think Durand me should win it but also but I can't get out of my head the idea that like Holm has been in there with everybody at a high level and Durand me has not it feels like Holm is supposed to be better yeah but I'm not sure exactly. that she actually yeah. is and, 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 and particularly in this kind of matchup because again, it's a kickboxing match, and Jermaine Duran to me is longer, and hits harder, and hasn't shown any issues with stamina, and really only struggles all that much um, when people try to take her down. So it'll be interesting. It'll be very interesting, um, and I'm looking forward to it. But uh, sad to say, it may my pick suggests that it will be Holly Holmes' third loss in a row. 
So yeah, what can um, you do? God, I I honestly don't know. I, I feel th- for him. Man. I guess I, I like Holly Holm. I want to see her do well. Yeah, I guess I'm gonna pick Durandamy. I guess oh, that was the pick that I made in my preview, which has yet to be published. But I th- so I guess I'm picking Durandamy. But with the strong caveat that Holm could ju- it could just the fight could start, it could get going, and we just see oh there are levels to this. Could be, could be. Yeah, I'm, I'm not too. I'm not as worried about it as you are, but it, it could be. So uh, that does it for this segment. Why don't we take a break? When we come back, uh, we will try to run quickly through the rest of the fights that we want to discuss from this card, including Anderson Silva versus Derek Brunson, Glover Teixeira versus Jared Cannonier, and more. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening to this week's Heavy Hands. If you like what you hear, please consider pledging to support the podcast on Patreon. Patreon is basically continuous crowdfunding. You sign up to contribute a certain amount per month to help us with production costs and the like, and in return you get rewards ranging from a mention on the Heavy Hands website to a question or topic of your choice being discussed on the show. We have a lot more in the works to reward you for your help, and we appreciate every contribution. No amount is too small. Just head over to patreon.com and find how you can help out the only show dedicated to the finer points of face punching. Now let's get back to it. And welcome back to Heavy Hands. Anderson Silva versus Derek Brunson. Uh, fans of the Spider are surely shaking their heads to to think that Anderson Silva, who went for, I don't know, eight years or something and 17 fights undefeated, is now winless in his last five. It's a terrible situation to, to find oneself in. They have been some fun fights. He has had his moments. He came close to um, at least starting to finish Daniel Cormier, which was a surprise. He very nearly finished Michael Bisping on several occasions. And then he, he did beat Nick Diaz uh, before that was taken away from him due to a drug failure. So there have been moments. But Anderson Silva's always been a guy who has moments and those moments used to lead to the end of the fight and they're not leading there anymore now he takes on Derek Brunson who uh didn't look too good against Robert Whitaker uh shall I say um Derek Brunson whose crazy totally reckless style of striking I had hoped was just a factor of the type of people he'd been fighting, but was in fact something he felt that he could do against an excellent counterpuncher. So that raises some red flags for a fight against Anderson Silva. Do you agree, Pat? I do. And that's kind of the basic dynamic here is can Anderson Silva recapture enough of his old magic for long enough in a matchup that should be stylistically favorable to him? That's the real question, right, is there's nobody who's still ranked close to the top of the UFC's middleweight division who is a better stylistic matchup for Silva than Brunson, because theoretically speaking, like Brunson is not a great range striker, right? He he can do that, but really what he's trying to do is dive forward to get you into the clinch. So he's going to throw a hard left hand. He's going to lunge in with that and try to wrap you up. Now, if that's going to be his plan... Silva Silva has the counter striking skills to make him pay for that lunging type of movement and he should have the clinch game to be able to at least neutralize Brunson if not beat him there. Mm-hmm. That's that's on paper what this matchup looks like. Now the question is can Silva's chin take Brunson's left hand which is a heavy potent left hand? Uh is he physical enough at at his advanced age, he's 41 to be able to hang with a a spry 32 year old in mm-hmm. the clinch? Will he pull like, the trigger? Can he pull the trigger? Right. Yeah. I mean, can he can he fight at pace? Is that a thing that he can do? I don't think it doesn't can. seem like it. Yeah, he, he certainly I mean, we we've we've both kind of agreed in the past that in his recent fights, Anderson has looked like a guy who is really, really cautious of tiring himself out. Um, and I think that if he tries to match pretty much any active fighter's pace at this point for volume, he tires himself out too much to the point where he feels like he can't respond. I think that explains to me anyway, to my satisfaction. Um, the long bouts of his fight with Michael Bisping in which he was just sort of trying to defend himself with his back against the cage. Um, and I, mm-hmm. I sort of suspect that for a long time that has been the reason that Anderson backs himself into the cage and lets the other guy. It's to get in their head, but it's also to rest. And I think he's become more and more of a necessity with each passing, uh, each passing fight. Yeah, I wrote a piece last year. This is one of my favorite MMA pieces I've ever written where I went back and I looked at the entire career of Anderson Silva And my argument in that piece, and this is one that I stick by, is that Anderson has actually been past his prime since about 2008. 
that the last fight where he was really in his prime was maybe the Marquardt fight, maybe the Henderson fight, somewhere in there. And everything after that has been a process of adjustment to his diminishing physical capacities. The, the Lightest fight, the Cote fight, the Maya fight, that, that stretch right there, with the exception of the Griffin fight, where he seemed to figure things out again, like that, that stretch was him trying to figure out how do I deal with the fact that I can't get myself into the kind of shape I used to, I can't go hard at pace for as long as I used to, I'm not strong enough anymore or physical enough in the clinch with this new generation of big, strong middleweights. Like, how do I adjust my game to get to the point where I can still make hay? And mm -hmm. the fact that he went on an incredible run after that has kind of blinded us to the fact that Anderson's game really did change. Oh, yeah. In, I those, mean, in, in that stretch. The, he became a completely different fighter. The ironic thing is that the slick counterpunching Anderson, the Anderson we all love, who, who, who lives in the Matrix, um, per your theory, is basically an adaptation to Anderson feeling that he can't do his old style anymore. It's actually exactly. an adaptation to feeling old. Yeah. And now, so now if that was the post prime version of Anderson, what do we have now? I mean, we have a guy who can't fight at pace for any particular length of time, whose chin isn't as good as it used to be, who is reduced to fighting in short bursts that may still be exceptionally dangerous. Like he almost finished Bisping. He did some serious damage to Cormier in those brief bursts on two days notice, yeah. which is totally insane. Two days notice, like, he almost finished him with a liver kick. Yeah, I mean, this is, Anderson is still Anderson on some level. And that's, so I'm going to say it out front. I'm picking him against Brunson because I think if you, if you give Anderson still the most stylistically favorable matchup at this point, I think he has just enough left that he can make you pay for that. And I'll go ahead and say that I'm picking Brunson. Um, and I I think the reason for that is that I don't think this is the most stylistically favorable matchup for Anderson. It may be the most forgiving matchup in the middleweight top 10, uh, but I don't think even that is really a very forgiving matchup for Anderson at this point. Uh, and and I'll, I'll, say, I'll say my reason for that so that you can retort. Uh, the, the, the instinct, I think, is to look at this as kind of a grappler versus striker matchup. Not necessarily saying that's what you were doing, but that was my first instinct is that I often try to reduce fights in my head to their most basic parts to try and understand the dynamics. And that's what occurs to you, right? It's Anderson Silva likes to strike, always has, and usually struggles the most, or at least historically has, with wrestlers, um, a type of fighter which he actually didn't have to fight that all that often, even during his incredible middleweight championship run. Uh, but when he did, Chris Weidman, Chael Sonnen, uh, Daniel Cormier, he had trouble, and he tended to play a pretty defensive game on the ground as a result. Then we have Derek Brunson, likes to take people down, likes to beat them up in the clinch and from top position, uh, has a, quite a few submission wins as well. Clearly, his goal is usually to grapple people, or at least that is probably what he's best at. The difference here um, that changes it from that basic dy dynamic for me is that Anderson Silva's unwillingness or inability to pull the trigger as much as he used to makes him a less effective striker, whereas Derek Brunson's aggression and power makes him a more effective striker than he should be otherwise. Uh, I do hope that he doesn't come in like a maniac because I can't tell you how disappointed I was to see him do that against Robert Whitaker of all people. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like what, why would you, why would you run chin first at Robert Whitaker? Uh, well, that wasn't his plan, but he got, but by the time he got cracked a couple of times, he lost control and went to that particular yeah, approach. It, it looked to me like it, like some sort of, just severe impatience. Like he just couldn't wait to get the clinch because when he's not feeling that way, he's actually not a bad kickboxer. You know, he's, he's pretty good. He was competitive with you all Romero on the feet. Um, he's had other fights in the past where he's kickboxed fairly well with people. Uh, his knockout of Brian Houston, of course, uh, or knockout and then submission. Very impressive. Uh, so he can throw some clean, well-placed, well-timed strikes at range, um, even the Uriah Hall fight, it wasn't so much of a bum rush as it was just a clean left hand with a nice rhythm change to set it up. Tyron Woodley-esque, if you will. But I, my hope now is that Derek Brunson will at last have learned the lesson that you cannot do that against a dangerous counterpuncher. I would be baffled 
if he came into this fight having just experienced the most severe consequences of that approach and still allowed himself to get impatient enough that he would just rush after Anderson because he has an advantage of youth. Um, he has a stamina advantage. He can match Anderson's power and he's more willing to throw. So he has a lot of innate advantages on the feet that he doesn't have to do anything crazy to make work for him. And then of course there is his clinch in his wrestling game. So I don't disagree with any of that, but you keep looking for, and we talked about this before the Whitaker fight. We had exactly this conversation before the excuses Whitaker fight. Excuses for Derek Brunson. <laughs> I mean, I'm not going to call them excuses, but I will say <laughs> I think you're reading into a Brunson that isn't entirely there. Mm -hmm. Like the, those are all, the, what you said is those are all true things, but that's not who Derek Brunson is. And like, yes, he can kickbox. That's, he can do a great job kickboxing at range. He can throw a nice left hand. He can throw a nice head kick. He can exchange in the pocket. He can get in and out on lines, mm -hmm. but he chooses not to because mm -hmm. that's not who he is. Because at heart, Derek Brunson is a forward moving pressure fighter, or actually I think more specifically, I think he's a swarmer. I think that is at the most basic level, what he feels comfortable doing. It's what he thinks his strengths are. It's what he wants to be doing in the cage is getting in his opponent's face, making him feel his strength and his power and shoving them up against the fence where he can do all that most effectively. I think that is what drives him. I think he can do other things. I think he can be more or less measured about how he chooses to go about doing that. But at the end of the day, if your innermost desire is to be moving forward, like that's probably what you're going to end up doing. Yeah. And we saw the fullest expression of that against Robert Wade. Well, Even in the Romero fight, remember, he was coming in. He was moving forward. When he was kickboxing effectively, it was more measured, but it was still forward moving. Yeah. It was still forward movement. In, in the past, we have described uh, style as the thing that you do when you're uncomfortable. You know what I mean? Or the thing that you do mm -hmm. when you have no other choice. And in that sense, then, it does seem that Derek Brunson's instinct, his, his innate style – that de determined by his personality is to just go nuts and go after people. Uh, I would like to see him hone that, you know, like being a swarmer is not a bad thing, but just not, you know, have the technique to back it up. That would be great. Um, well, he does have that and he, and he has honed it and, but, uh, but still on some level, he can't get over the instinct to come forward yeah. and, and to just let it all hang out to brawl. when he needs to. Yeah. I mean, I think that, for whatever reason, that seems to be his baseline thing. I, I, he's a good fighter. I think he's a really good fighter. Mm -hmm. I think he probably, in fact, I mean, I think he probably will win this fight because I think he probably will catch Anderson with a shot that Anderson's chin just can't take anymore. But until I see Anderson Silva get knocked out by the Derek Brunsons of the world, I'm not going to pick that to happen <laughs> because I now that I'm kind of reviewing the film and I just rewatched the Cormier fight, I rewatched, uh, I'm, I'm rewatching the, the Bisping fight for the second time again right now. Anderson looked better than I remembered him looking in those fights from a technical perspective. Like he, when he, when he was on the feet, he was doing good work. If he had, you know, six weeks to prepare for Daniel Cormier's takedowns, maybe he would have been able to stuff some of them. He looked fine for the most part against Bisping um, when he was in the pocket and moving. Like, I, I think the skills are still there. The question of whether he can pull the trigger is a real one. I hope I don't sound too much like a fanboy when I say these things, but I do believe that the kind of lunging face first thing is a is an inherent is not separable from yeah, I think, personality. I think you may be right. So you may be right. the and question I have, to me I have is too, whether Anderson can capitalize on that. Yeah. Too many excuses for Derek Brunson. It's interesting. I you know, I would still I, I'm I'm still not quite sure exactly what the trigger is for Derek Brunson because you he, you're right he he did come forward in the Yoel Romero fight, but at no point did he go crazy. You know what I mean? He didn't do what he did to Robert Whitaker, which is chase someone in a straight line, losing his feet behind him, flinging both hands with his chin in the air, uh, for like, for more than a second at a time against Yoel Romero, and Romero was competing with him on the feet and not allowing him to do what he wants to do. Derek Brunson was not in charge, clearly, in that fight at any point. And so you would think those would be the circumstances that would prompt him to just sort of lose, cause lose his cool and go nuts. And yet, mm. against Robert Whitaker, it happens so quickly. Against, uh, you know, it's, so some, it's, it's, it's really it's hard to predict for me which fights Derek Brunson 
will manage to maintain his discipline and which fights he will just totally lose sight of his of that discipline. Um, my guess is it has something to do with when Greg Jackson's in his corner or not mm. and when he's done his ca- camps at Jackson's. So I think that Brunson, when he trains with Greg Jackson, is a much more measured version of himself because he's been trained effectively in the game plan for the entirety of his mm. camp. When he's training in North Carolina, I think when Brunson's training more in North Carolina, I think his baseline skills may actually look a little better, a little sharper. I think his hands may, I think his technique may be a little better, but I don't think he's as measured. I don't think he's as prepared for everything his opponent's going to throw at him. Yeah. So it's a good shout. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, and he tra- it's worth noting, as far as I know, Brunson has trained entirely in North Carolina for this. I don't think he went to Jackson's. Oh, boy. So. Um, oh boy. so take that as you will. I don't know. I, I think, I think Brunson will probably win, but I'm still picking Anderson just cause I can't get over the face first thing versus a good counter puncher. Sure. Like that's, you know, I, I'm happy to be wrong. I'm happy to be wrong about it. I'd be I happy I to see be. Anderson win. Like who, who could be, who could be mad about Anderson Silva getting one last win in the twilight of his career? Yeah, it would yeah. be great. So uh, let's move on. And we'll, again, I said we were going to try and quickly get through these, but people care about Anderson Silva. People care about him getting a chance to to fight a lower tier opponent and, and hopefully get back on the winning track. So we can invest some time in that. Light heavyweights, though, don't necessarily – man, I want to talk a long time about this fight too because I actually really like it. Go over to Shara versus Jared Cannonier. Uh, when it was announced, which was very quickly after Jared Cannonier's victory over Ion Kutalaba, uh, great fight, by the way. If you haven't seen it, go check it out. Uh, I was, of course, as I always am, being a curmudgeon and saying that it was too much too soon. And I think it may still be. Then again, Jared Cannonier, when I reflected on it, I realized is 32 years old. He began fighting in 2011 in earnest. He had a year off in 2012. He's been fighting actively since 2013. Uh, he should be right around the corner from his prime uh, if you determine his time. And as far as age is concerned... He's nearing the end of his athletic prime. So it's probably now or never for Jared Kinnear to really make an impression. And the more I looked at this matchup, the more I kind of felt that Jared Kinnear might win it. That maybe Glover Teixeira's time at the top is not long for this world. And that uh, he, a fighter on his way out versus a fighter um, who is finally coming into his own is maybe a more interesting fight than I thought. Yeah, I think I, I agree with all that. I think that this is a, a tough stylistic matchup for Glover Teixeira. Yeah. That was what was really striking to me watching the film on this because Cannonier is a real good striker. Um, he's a pretty good defensive wrestler. Uh, he's been in there with some big, strong guys over the years. He's uh, he's a skilled striker. That's the thing to say. Yes. He's crafty. He's got a lot of underlying technical skills. He, he is skill. both I think- very powerful and also very skilled. Yeah, especially the thing that really stands out to me, especially because this is a thing that's always been a problem for Glover Teixeira, is Cannonier's footwork. I was going to say the same thing. The way he pivots away from from shots coming towards his face, gets his shoulder in front of his chin, and angles off Mm -hmm. is great. It's not something you typically see, especially in the light heavyweight division. Yeah, that to me is going to be the key to this fight, is can Cannonier keep his feet moving under him? Can he stay away from the fence? Can he avoid the wheelhouse of Glover Teixeira, which is... When Teixeira slips his way into the pocket, throws a kind of a probing right hand, and then falls with that monster left hook. Yeah. Yeah, and also, uh, of course, I think Teixeira's uh, wrestling. It's always been an underrated part of his Mm -hmm. game. But Cannonier was taken down six times by Yohan Kudalaba. Um, He got back up, and he was very impressive defensively off of his back. But he did get taken down six times by a worse wrestler than Glover Teixeira, probably. One who's more aggressive and probably faster but technically not as good of a wrestler. Yeah, my, Teixeira, I mean, Teixeira is a really good takedown artist, especially, yeah. but but the problem with Teixeira's wrestling game, and this is where the footwork comes into play, this is what makes this an, an interesting matchup here, is all of Teixeira's offense is short-range offense. Yes. All of it. And even his takedown game is like that. When Teixeira hits takedowns, they're almost always, his entry is almost always a snatch single. Mm-hmm. Even if he switches to a double after that, it's almost always, we're at close range, I'm going to fake high, duck under, grab a leg, and then either run the pipe to finish a single or switch to a double and finish from there. That's basically his only entry. It's a very technically skilled wrestling game. He's got good technique, especially on that single, especially when he gets his head inside and runs the pipe to finish. 
Like he's a very clean technician with that, but it's basically that entry. He doesn't have a whole lot of varied setups for how he's going to get in on your hips. So from Cannoneer, so that means that for Cannoneer, this is basically all about his footwork. Yeah. Whereas Kutalaba had a lot of different entries, had a lot of different ways that he set up those takedowns. He got in on, he got in on singles. He got in on doubles. He finished with, he finished he, with body he got locks. a lot of them from the clinch. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's, uh, there were a lot of different ways that Kutalaba got in on that. That's not really to share his takedown game. True. So if Cannoneer can stick and move at all costs and keep his feet going and keep his jab out there, he's got a really nice, long a snapping jab, mm -hmm. then suddenly this is very tough. I think Teixeira wins I th because I think eventually he does get takedowns and from top position, Teixeira is just a monster. But this is a winnable matchup for Cannoneer. That's, it, this was a good choice. Like if you're going to take that step up in competition – then this was the right top 10 matchup for Cannoneer right now. Yeah, I, I'm actually going to go with Cannoneer in this one. I think this one reminds me, the best parallel, I often try and look for stylistic parallels to try and judge a fighter's success rate, is probably Teixeira's fight with Ovin St. Preux in terms of athleticism and speed. The difference being that Cannoneer is a lot more precise and technical than St. Preux with his striking. He's also mm -hmm. a lot more precise and technical when he's taken down. Like St. Preux, he can be taken down. But unlike St. Preux, he won't just try to exhaust himself by bench pressing Glover to share off of him and 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 sort of rolling over and standing back up. Um, he will play guard a little bit, and that might seem counterintuitive, but I think that's probably the better option is to try and get some butterflies or get feet on hips and try to actually use jujitsu to get Glover to share off of you and to defend yourself. Because as much as young Kutalaba got him down, he also did basically nothing from top position, which is saying a lot because he has nasty ground and pound. He is actually very, very good in that position. And he went for it, and Cannoneer was savvy enough to keep him from doing any significant damage. So um, avoiding takedowns and being just good enough to survive if he does get taken down, I hope. But uh, Glover Teixeira's jiu-jitsu and his ground and pound are both, of course, very fearsome. And he's probably... In fact, he's definitely a more control-oriented top position player than Ion Kutalaba. So, mm -hmm. yeah, if he can lock Cannoneer down on the ground, the, this could become a very different fight very quickly. But yeah, uh, I had one more note I wanted to make about Glover Teixeira because I think it's a meaningful one. Is He has continued to get better over the last few fights. Like I kind of thought he was done after he lost to Phil Davis. I thought, well, okay, he's been fighting professionally for like 12 years. Yeah. He's in his mid-30s. Like He's probably at the end of his athletic prime. Teixeira has looked better in each outing. Except, I mean, leaving aside the Anthony Johnson fight, which was over in what thirteen seconds. Yeah, like not much of a chance to look good there. <laughs> yeah, leaving that aside, uh, Teixeira has made like marked improvements to his footwork and his head movement and his uh, and his ability to get inside safely. Um, he's much less of a plotter than he used to be. He kicks more than he used to. Like he has looked like a better fighter. Um, especially the jump from the St. Prue fight to the Cummins fight and then the Cummins fight to the Evans fight. Like, he's looked better in all those. I think it was just really striking. And so, you know, shouts to Glover Teixeira for continuing to improve in his, like, late 30s now. Yeah, Glover's an awesome guy, too. I mean, you got to root for him. I just, mm -hmm. I, I worry that at 37, with, as you said, well over a decade of uh, fighting behind him, and now, you know, the first knockout loss of his career since his very first fight, I just wonder how much he has left. Hmm. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a good question. It's worth thinking about. You want to, so you, should we move on? Yeah. Randy Brown is the next one. Um, before we do a break, let's, let's just make the next segment all for UFC fight night. One Oh four. Let's very quickly talk about Randy Brown. He's the last guy we want to talk about in earnest from UFC 208. Uh, we've talked about him a few times on this show before he is to me, um, maybe along with Ricardo Ramos now, one of the more interesting looking for a fight prospects, one of the more promising ones uh, with serious potential. And uh, we said that initially basically because of things that Randy had not yet learned to, to tap, at, at least for me. You know, it was, look at this guy, his reach, his size, his athleticism. He's very athletic for a guy as lanky as he is. Um, he, he seems to kind of know how to fight in the clinch to start with. He already had some nice raw signs of potential from the beginning. And with his build, of course, um, that just made him a, a guy to watch. Uh, the problem for Randy was that basically throughout the first three fights of his UFC career, he was not taking advantage of, uh, of his frame the way that he probably could have. 
uh, especially for a guy, as you pointed out before we began today, Pat, with a boxing background. Uh, it was very striking to note that Randy, it was very striking, pun intended, to note that Randy Brown really didn't have a jab. Um, he didn't have the best friend of every long and tall fighter in his arsenal and seemed really, really insistent. For example, when he fought Matt Dwyer, he traded right hands with Dwyer over and over again. Um, and constantly sought the clinch, which is a place at which he does good work. But it was shocking to see that he didn't really have any technical ways to close the gap or prevent the gap from being closed or set up his right hand or his entries. It was mostly just him moving and moving and moving and throwing a right hand. Neil Magny-esque, if you will, where the, the left hand moves around and does some stuff, but he's not really just dropping his weight and snapping the other guy's head back with a jab. And fortunately, I think probably right when he needed it most in his last fight with Brian Camozzi, who is a good technical fighter whose whose build is very similar to Randy Brown's, um, who does have a good uh, kickboxing game. Right when he needed it most, Randy Brown had a jab. Uh, he angled off of it. He popped uh, Brian Camozzi with it. He hurt him with the right hand after blinding him with the jab. Suddenly, he was doing things, not, not only throwing his left hand, executing techniques off of the right hand, using the opportunities created by that jab. And to me, that is the most important improvement I have seen out of Randy Brown yet. Yeah, it was really interesting when Brown came into the UFC, because I think we actually had a conversation about him, not for his first fight, but for his second fight, when he fought Michael Graves, maybe. Mm -hmm. Does that sound right? Yeah, we, we talked yeah. about it. I remember we opposed each other in that one. Yeah, I think you picked Graves and I think I picked Brown. I think I was wrong and you were right. <laughs> Time to gloat. <laughs> I'm going to yeah. gloat about a fight that happened at the beginning of 2016. Hell yeah. <laughs> I um, got one right. Well, <laughs> well, so what's what's interesting, though, is we both saw Brown's talent and potential at that point, And yes. now he seems to be living up to it. Yeah. There's a, there's a great irony to me that there are a lot of guys who have a kind of a striking background like Brown does. I'm not sure what how deep his boxing background went, but I know he had been a he had done some boxing. That, But for his first few fights in the UFC, he was mostly a clinch guy. He was mostly get into the clinch with yeah. you, use the use his size and his leverage, maybe take you down. Uh, he got really lucky to find a choke against Eric Montano mm -hmm. in the third round of that fight in what had been way, way more competitive than it needed to be. He was on his Largely way because losing. Brown wouldn't pull the trigger and throw at range. Yeah. And so I think, but now I think you're right to point to the Kamotsi fight because now what we're seeing from Brown is like, Okay, he's growing more comfortable. He feels like he can let his shots go. And if that's the case, the potential that we saw in Randy Brown is going to start to come to the fore. Um, so I think we'll see that against Bilal Muhammad, which is way better than what the initial fight had been. It had been Brown versus George Sullivan. Mm. This is a much more competitive matchup, much more fun yeah, matchup. Yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah, and, 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 and Muhammad is, is, is also a technical, rangy fighter. Um, whose real difficulty is his defense. And so Randy Brown will have to be careful, but he will also have the opportunity to really shine against someone who has had some impressive performances in the UFC already. So I'm looking forward to it. I just want to see, you know what it may be is that, uh, cause there are some other, I don't know, maybe Cody Garbrandt, who, who else are some examples of people with striking backgrounds who, who came, I mean, we see it with wrestlers a lot. We see wrestlers come into MMA and fall in love with striking. Because to them, that's the change from their original background. They look at MMA and they say, oh, people hit each other in this. And it's like they pour all of their energies into learning how to do that. To the point that sometimes, like uh, Yoel Romero, they forget uh, how effective the wrestling can be and how effective a base it is for MMA. That they don't just have to go to it when they need it, that they can use it offensively. They can push that advantage. And Randy Brown seems to have taken that approach again i don't uh, like you i don't know what his boxing background really is but uh it seemed like oh mma is the one where they they clinch and they they go for submissions and stuff and that was what he was focusing on in about his first three fights in uh, the ufc and now that he's gotten comfortable with that i think I, I it's nice to see that the boxing background is coming back out it is it's re-emerging to the surface yeah, because he was really throwing last time out. Like, he was sneaking oh, yeah. shots around. His combinations looked good. He stayed over his feet when he threw. Like, a lot to like there. I'm really looking forward to that fight. I believe that is the prelim main event as the card is currently lined up. So yeah, we can look forward knows. to seeing that, I believe, on Fox Sports 1. 
Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so that, that does it for this fight uh, This fight card. When we come back from this break, as noted before, Chan Sung Jung versus Dennis Bermudez and much, much more from UFC Fight Night 104. Financial support is fantastic, but there are other, even easier ways to support heavy hands. Perhaps the best is by spreading the word. We know our fan base. You're all cool, popular people with serious social media presences. You're tastemakers and trendsetters. Okay, there are one or two of you that don't fit that description. You know who you are. But no matter what, you can always help us out by telling folks about the show. You can also give us a positive rating and review on iTunes and Stitcher, things like that. We rely on word of mouth and positive feedback to grow and improve. So thank you very much for your time and your help. Now, back to the show. And welcome back. UFC Fight Night 104, the Korean zombie returns. Pat, may I be the first to say, and their tanks and their bombs and their bombs and their guns. And uh, well <laughs> done to, uh, to Chan Sung Jung, who the nostalgia, man, just having him back in the octagon, having him come out to his old song and having him even having him put on what looked to me like a more refined version of his old style, which is great because that's kind of uh, what he was doing for the last two fights or so was sort of refining that zombie style. He could still be a zombie, but he's a zombie. He's like, uh, he's, um, he's, uh, hold on. I need to get my zombie movie references. Correct. Not land of the dead. Uh, <laughs> which one is it? He's, he's not uh, dawn of the dead, but he's day of the dead. <laughs> right he's like learning to use tools yeah that'll play that'll play uh, <laughs> Boy, i yeah, wish i, I could have gotten that reference out more quickly <laughs> so this was it was interesting I'm, I'm glad you talked about the refinement because brian stan mentioned on the broadcast that uh despite his time away the the zombie had continued to train at his normal gym like he was in the military but stan said i think i'm quoting him exactly on this because of his injuries yeah the army gave uh, the zombie, basically a desk job. Well, what, what so happens he... is in South Korea, you're, you're rated based on your physical capability. Um, mm -hmm. And if you are a four or higher, or maybe it's a four or below uh, out of a, a 10 scale, then you are not fit for military service. And if you do military service, like actual active military service, you have to live in the barracks. You have to live or at a, you know, a some kind of military facility. You only get to even go home and see your family. You only get to leave on vacations. You get holidays. And so it was actually very clever of the Korean zombie to take his military service now when he had that shoulder injury because it was that injury which allowed him to have a desk job, which meant he could go home to his family at 5 p.m. every day and he could train after work. And I think that is, without that, we would not have seen anything close to this level of improvement. Yeah, that's really interesting. That's a really good point. I mean, it, there's some irony, of course, in thinking about one of the fittest people on the planet, a literal professional athlete right. not being physical, <laughs> physically capable right. of doing his military service. Like, there's, there's something ironic about that. But at any rate, I mean, it seems like the zombie has, like you said, refined and improved his game. Um, the He still got hit a little more maybe than I would be comfortable with, and I think that was a little bit of that was the ring rust. Sure. Uh, but otherwise, that fight looked basically exactly how I thought it would, with Bermudez doing a good job of sticking and moving, using his speed, landing good shots, trying for takedowns, but eventually uh, getting into the, a firefight at the wrong time and ducking his way right into a shot. That's exactly what we saw. The zombie has always been great at picking and choosing his shots, yeah. right? At moving his shots around his opponent's glove, under the guard, uh, working to the body when it's there. Those have always been his strengths, and it seems like those are even sharper now. Yeah, well, he's, a, he's an interesting case study for how styles can change over time. Because what we might expect from somebody who is a brawler, and that's why he was the Korean zombie, he just came after people and traded shots. It, a lot of times we would expect that person to adopt a really aggressive style with a lot of volume, like a pressure fighter, a swarm, or something like that. And it hasn't really been the case with Korean zombie. Because I think what made him such a good brawler is the zombiness. He doesn't blink. You know, he doesn't uh, flinch. He doesn't shy away. He's got really good eyes, even in a seemingly wild exchange. Uh, when somebody's throwing heat at him, he's ready to pick them off with the perfect shot. And so he has kind of become, we talked about this last week, more of a counterpuncher, somebody who, who uses a jab, who gets the other person to throw, and in the exchange finds the opening. 
And um, we both thought you were more confident than I and, and good for you for doing it. But we both thought that ultimately there would be an exchange in which Dennis Bermudez would just get caught. Uh, if it's going to come down to a battle of chins, then Korean Zombie is probably going to come out on top. And it ended up being that uh, it did come surprisingly quickly. I'll say that much. I, I think I called a third or fourth round TKO. I did not expect him to just turn Bermudez's lights off three minutes into the fight. I, I actually kind of thought that that was pretty much how it would happen. Wow. Um, I, th I think I picked second round, but I could have seen first round for sure, because that's just the nature of Bermudez's game. He's going to give you opportunities and yeah. chances. And lo and behold, that's exactly what happened. Like Bermudez looked real good before that. And that's why Bermudez has always been one of my favorite guys to watch. Like, even if I know at this point, he's not really a contender, like he's going to go for it. He's going to throw stuff out there. He's going to give you your shots. If you can capitalize you can make hay with him. Yeah. So too, however, did Korean Zombie, not necessarily with taking strikes, but um, he said he worked on his wrestling a lot, and it was phenomenal because Dennis Bermudez is a very good takedown artist. I mean, he's one of the best takedown artists in this division, and Chan Sung Jung doesn't take him down once, and he didn't even come close. He stuffed every single takedown with ease. So I think the willingness to keep a little bit longer distance and let the opponent come to him helps with that, but also... Yeah, he's, he's clearly made some improvements in his time away. And can I talk really briefly, too, about what a perfect uppercut that was? Because um, it was a, it's just a really good example. I want to seize on it, as I already have on Twitter. But a lot of we don't see a lot of really, really good uppercuts in MMA. And uh, the reason is because a lot of people are taught to throw uppercuts wrong. I would say wrong. Um, even good fighters. Like, you watch Mike Tyson throwing uppercuts, and he threw straight up and down. And a lot of fighters throw that way. That's what they think of. An uppercut is something that goes a 90-degree angle from the floor and knocks the other person's chin up. Um, Roberto Duran threw his uppercuts that way in the clinch when the opponent's chin was directly above his fist. And that's a good time for that. But the difference is that, uh, for me, a proper uppercut has a 45-degree angle. It has a diagonal trajectory outward away from your body. And one, I think you get better drive from the hip. And you can really see Korean Zombie put his hip into that uppercut. But two, and more importantly, when you throw your uppercut like that, you don't miss if the other guy pulls his head back. If you throw straight up and down, you have a very narrow lane of effectiveness with that punch. And if the other guy just leans back, the uppercut's gone. This kind of uppercut, you have to slip. And people are not really comfortable slipping uppercuts. So it's a much more effective punch. And it was beautifully set up with the jab, beautifully timed. I just want to celebrate it because uh, it was great. And a, a fellow said to me on Twitter that he was watching the fights with Terrence Crawford's trainer, who was apparently a little drunk at the time, but was really, really excited about the form of that uppercut as well. So I know I'm in good company and being excited about it. Yeah, well, there is no punch in MMA that I think we see more thrown or that we see thrown more often badly than the uppercut. Even in uh, boxing, I think that's the case. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, I think it's the hardest punch, really and truly. I think it's the hardest punch to throw well. I think it's actually harder than a jab to throw well. Sure. Like, because it's an awkward motion. It's a fundamentally awkward motion. And it's hard to throw it without compromising your defense. Mm -hmm. Like, there's a lot of guys throw the uppercut just by dropping their hand to their waist and then throwing from there. That is not the right way to throw an no. uppercut. The, the proper way to throw an uppercut involves slightly changing your level and then driving upward. Yeah. As opposed to just dropping your hand. Like you don't drop, the way we see it. You don't drop the hand, you pull the elbow back if you want to get yep. your arm into position. Exactly. Yeah. There's it's hard to get your hips into the shot. It's an awkward motion, especially I think the lead hand uppercut, even more so. Yeah. Um it's it's an awkward motion to do right. The way the zombie threw it was perfect. Yeah. I think throwing it in the pocket off of a slip the way that he did is clever because it loads your hips for it. It makes it a more natural motion mm -hmm. to start with. But um it's sad that we see so few good uppercuts in MMA because there's more utility for it in MMA than there is, I sure. think, frankly, in boxing. I mean, it, why do you think that uh, Korean Zombie went for it? I'm sure it was because Bermudez was so committed to his level changes, whether with his strikes or his takedowns. It's perfect. It's It, it responds to so many things that your opponents want to do to you. Yep, So yeah. exactly. Same deal with stepping knees. I think there's more utility for stepping knees than there is actually in Muay Thai. Yeah, but as a boxing head, I do have to point out that... Uh, the uppercut is probably safer than the stepping knee, although less dangerous. You can take an uppercut better than you could take a knee, <laughs> but yeah, uh, you also don't true. give the opponent your hips if he's going for a takedown. Yeah, fair point. Um, Let's okay. talk about Alexa Grasso very quickly because 
uh, it wasn't what we expected. It wasn't what anyone expected. In fact, Felice Herrick was a massive underdog, which I, I thought was wrong. I didn't think she deserved to be such an underdog because she's a veteran. But I also didn't really see um, her path to victory. I thought, and we both said this, she would force Grosso to adapt. Uh, and that made her a good, winnable fight. Grosso didn't really adapt. Um, that was the difficulty. She, I think, looked like she expected something very different from Felice Herrig. And I think we did as well. Um, last week when I talked about Felice Herrig's kickboxing, you said, you know, quite rightly, she doesn't really do it all that much. She's not really confident in her kickboxing. In fact, I, it's, it's maybe a little overrated. But she leaned on it this time. She wasn't desperate for clinches. She wasn't shooting for takedowns. She kickboxed with Alexa Grosso, and she did it pretty well. And so I think that really threw Grosso's game off. But you had a particular theory as to why Grosso looked the way she did. Yeah, I think it's because this is something we've talked about a fair bit over the course of this show is the difference between an organic striker and a rote striker. That an organic striker, their game is predicated on reading what the opponent is doing and responding to it. Um, or forcing the opponent to respond in particular ways and then exploiting it. That there's kind of a a plan that's happening as you're striking. That's it, you're you're responding to conditions as they unfold in the fight. That some examples of a particularly organic striker would be Anderson Silva. I think as the quintessential organic striker. I think Anthony Pettis is a really organic striker sure. in the way that he moves his shots around. Um, a road striker is somebody who comes in with set triggers based on things that they have trained over and over and over and over and over again in the gym. So to me, Frankie Edgar is the quintessential example of a rote striker in MMA. So somebody who is hitting the pads, hitting the pads, hitting the pads, hitting the pads, and that's exactly how they're going to throw it in the fight. They have specific triggers that work that way. And I think uh, Edson Barboza, very much like this too. Even before he started working with Mark Henry, Edson Barboza was a very yeah. rote kind of striker. It's not a statement no. on quality because there are organic no. strikers who are not as good as rote strikers. It, and some of it for rote strikers comes down to the quality of training and preparation, I think. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah, I don't, this is not a value judgment. You can be really good at both things. You can be really crappy at both things too. You can have organic strikers who do just a terrible job, who don't throw enough, or they're they they're reading it all wrong and they're picking and choosing the wrong shots. Like that is Chris entirely... Lieben. Chris Lieben was an organic striker. <laughs> yeah, Put that yeah, way. exactly. Yeah. That's a really good example. Um, so so take that as you will. The I think part of the issue here is that Grosso is a pretty rote striker, and I think she came into this fight with a plan, assuming that Herrig was going to try and pressure her and get in her face, shove her up against the cage try and take her down. So the so she expected to have to counter. She was going to pick Herrig apart at range, and then when Herrig came in, she had counter combos ready, and she was going to work her over in the clinch. She thought she was probably a better clinch fighter. So when that didn't happen, when Herrig was content to sit in the pocket and at long range and kickbox with her, I don't think Grasso had any idea how to react to that. And when she did go after Herrig, the, the things that she had trained over and over in that camp did not apply, so she ended up getting hit. I think more than she was yeah. expecting. She had to be totally creative. Like she had to improvise when she started to go after Herrick. It was a totally improvised approach to the fight. And she did. And, and I mean, and she won that third round pretty handily. Sure. Like that 30, 27 Herrick card is, is sneaky. One of the, one of the worst of the year. <laughs> so I don't, and I don't want to overstate this because I think there's room for disagreement here, but on my, I was shocked watching the fight. I thought Herrick won it live. When I rewatched it, I thought Grasso took it. So, yeah, I think I think I I couldn't watching it live. I could not be upset. I mean, I I, I was I was tweeting uh, about it and I was saying, you know, Grosso, where's Grosso's jab and why is she kicking so much? And I think she was as going by your theory, I think she was probably buying time and trying to figure out what she was supposed to do because the fight wasn't going the way she wanted it to. She was just mm -hmm. kind of filling time, filling space with throwaway strikes. Uh, she certainly wasn't putting much mustard on those kicks, so they didn't look like that was part of the game plan to me. But, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I was at live. I was saying Grosso, she ended the third round. She looked like she had no idea that she just lost that fight. And uh, while I don't think that's unreasonable for her to think that she won, it was kind of, to me, uh, a repeat of Anthony Pettis versus Eddie Alvarez, where both you and I thought Anthony Pettis had won. I totally see how Alexa Grosso could have won this fight. But in the end, it uh, it was a performance that, should be viewed as a learning experience. It was not yeah, should not be viewed as a robbery where you did really well, you did your best, and you just got robbed. 
Yeah, no, there, the fight was there for Grasso to take it, I think, especially in the second round. Yeah. Like, if she had turned it up as Herrig was just kind of sitting there pot-shotting her, that she could have put her stamp on that round and won that round the way that she did the third. Yeah. But it took her until the third round to really figure out, like, oh, I got to do the damn thing here. Yeah, so, good, good news is it's not close to being over for Alexa Grasso. She's 23 years old. She's only been fighting since 2012, the end of 2012. It, it does kind of make me wonder, though, like— if she sticks with the camp that she's at right now, which I believe in, involves her uncle and her father, is she going to be able to fix these kinds of problems? Like she's been okay so far, but is it just because she's that talented? What could she accomplish if she went elsewhere and tried some other things out? She apparently, people have told me this, has been vocal about she is not going to move. She is going to stay right there. I think that that probably changes when you lose when you lose a fight. I think your perspective probably changes on things. But if she's really wedded to that, I do mm -hmm. kind of wonder if there's going to be a ceiling on her. Like if they are training her in this exceptionally rote way and people just figure out, well, if I don't do what she's expecting me to, I can totally throw her off and give myself an opportunity to take two rounds. I, th I think it may also have been some of our our beloved uh, Masvidal, Musasi, Spencer, so on and so forth paradigm where I think Grosso felt like she was doing OK because she wasn't really losing the fight, you know, with emphasis on losing. She wasn't getting beaten up. And so I think she kind of felt like she did pretty well. She she really expected that she had won. I th she seemed to feel pretty confident that she had won. I think maybe she's one of those fighters whose um, mental definition of victory is different than it is for other fighters. She's not maybe a round winner, but she is somebody who, if she gets her shots in and she avoids damage, that she feels like she's doing what she needs to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, be. that's true. That's a That's a good point. That's a real concern. Could be. Uh, final words. Jessica Andrade and Angela Hill had a great fight. We really don't have much time left to discuss it, unfortunately. But uh, what are your thoughts on it? Um, I'm very excited to see Andrade fight Joanna Janjacek. That's yes. my takeaway from that. Me I thought too. that fight looked about like I thought it would. Uh, Hill did not do maybe as good a job as I thought she would of maintaining distance and keeping Andrade off her. But conversely, she also did more damage to Andrade than I thought she would when she got into those kinds of tight spaces to brawl. So... Um, this makes me think that for an Andrade, Ioana and Jacek fight, like, I don't think Ioana champion is going to be able to keep Andrade at bay the whole time. And if they get in tight, if Andrade can swing away, then she can make it, then she can make things happen. I think it'd look a lot like the Gedalia fight did. Um, uh, though I think Andrade is much more damaging and much more dangerous right. than Gedalia is on the feet. Yeah. Our, our buddy Schwan Humes was, uh, was a, a pretty fairly confident that Ioana would have the technical ability to uh, to respond to that kind of stuff from Andrade based on the Gadelia fight, but um, I'm not so sure. I, I'm I'm emboldened that he has confidence because, of course, I love you on a champion. Uh, she's one of my favorite fighters. I'd love to see her hold the belt forever. But uh, the, what worries me is that Andrade is a harder hitter than Gadelia. Gadelia has pop, but Andrade is a harder hitter and a more comfortable striker. She throws a lot more volume. She won't exhaust herself going for takedown attempts um, or really exhaust herself at all because her stamina did not look questionable in this fight. So I, I say, at least for the time being, the question of how much does the weight cut affect her has been answered. She looks good. You know, she looks like she can keep up a pace pretty well. I think she slowed down a bit, but she also fought at an insane breakneck speed. Mm -hmm. So yeah. so I went through and I counted over the first couple of rounds, and it, in no single minute of that fight did Andrade throw less than 15 strikes. Right. And that's Yuan insane. Yuanig and Jacek likes to s fill space with punches. She likes to throw combinations. She likes to plant her feet and pop off a few quick shots. And we've seen a few times now that she can be caught and hurt by people who just come after her and, and throw bombs over the top. So yeah, there was one one thing about Andrade I wanted to mention real fast because she's like like we talked about in last week's episode. She's almost entirely a swarmer. Like she does all of her damage when she backs you up and she really doesn't throw a whole lot when you're in open space. I was curious as to how that would work against somebody who was really doing a good job of actively trying to stay away from her the way that Hill did. And what Andrade does that somebody like John Lineker doesn't always is she follows with her shots. She keeps her feet moving when she, so like it's usually a counter that starts one of Andrade's flurries. She, unlike Lineker, does a good job of moving into those punches, of moving forward as she throws mm -hmm. and exploding into them. So that's what allows her to constantly stay on you is her feet are moving under her in a way that Lineker's feet are not always. So while that's a, probably the best comparison for what Andrade wants to do, Andrade is actually, I think, technically better at that one aspect of it, at following you in. 
Sure. Yeah, I think you're probably right. I think you're probably right. So it's an interesting fight. I'm, I, I, I guess we'll just say for now that we're both looking forward to breaking that one down before it happens. Oh, my God. Yes, please. It's, I'm definitely looking forward to watching it, but it is an interesting fight to think about. And we'll, we'll leave it at that. And uh, we will leave the episode at that. That about does it for us. That about does it. It's my new catchphrase. Pat, have you uh, liked me using it every single time I end a segment for the past three weeks? I'm very okay with it. Oh, great. Continue with that, Connor. Great, great. Well, that about does it for that little sidebar. Uh, let's move into the end of the episode. Uh, Pat, what do you have coming out this week? Not a whole lot. I think I'm going to have a complete guide for UFC 208. I will have That will be coming out on Wednesday on Bleacher Report. I will have an in-depth breakdown of Holly Holm versus Jermaine Durandamy, which will be coming out on the uh, for the Washington Post, I believe, on Thursday. I may or may not write one more thing for Bleacher Report this week. I'm not sure yet. Uh, otherwise, that's... Oh, a new episode of the History Matters podcast where we're talking about settlement patterns and the difference between city and the countryside and how that plays into the economy and politics and all sorts of other different stuff. Uh, it's an interesting episode. That should be out Monday or Tuesday, so it should be out by the time this episode is up. That's about it. What are you doing this week, Connor? Well, I do want to say first that people quite enjoyed our brief little discussion of uh, the Claudian invasion of Britain last time at the end of the show. So <laughs> I think sometime soon we're going to have to uh, engage in a three minute talk about Landsknecht uh, before the show is out. Talk about some German and Swiss mercenaries. <laughs> That'll Dude, be you know, fun. I'm always down to talk about early modern warfare. Of course. Of course. I want to talk about some pike and shots and tercios. God damn it. Mm-hmm. But uh, <laughs> mm-hmm. not talk dirty to me, Connor. <laughs> but until then. Um, let's see. What do I have coming out this week? Well, of course, there's my sure dog preview of UFC 208. That's in the bank. So you should expect that the next uh, day or so. And uh, we will have a bonus episode coming out this week. So uh, if you're not already uh, pledged to heavy hands on Patreon, just know that $3 a month will get you access to two bonus episodes every single month. So the first of those bonus episodes for February will be coming out sometime this week or maybe early next week. But we're going to be working on it after this recording session. A little inside baseball there. Then, um... I don't know, something for Bloody Elbow. Probably something on the Korean Zombie. Why not? Maybe I will talk about, you know what I think I'll do? I think I will do an article talking about um, the evolution of style from uh, from Brawler to Counterfighter and how that has worked in Korean Zombie's case and what made him makes him uh, more effective and more technical. Now, you know what's fun, Pat, is you have a clear idea of what's coming out for you <laughs> whenever I ask you, and I'm like improvising my article <laughs> premises on the spot. I'm <laughs> just thinking of what I'm going to be working on. It works, man. But this is, you know, I sit down every Sunday and I make a to do list of everything I'm going to have to do over the course of the next week. So I got to lock it in at that point. You're an adult. I mean, you know, that's different. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Yeah, that's 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 true, I guess. All right. I think you are also an adult, but. Well, I mean, technically, but, uh, you know, that's a conversation for another time. Conversation to have with my mother, probably. So well, let's wrap up today's episode. Thank you, everybody, for joining us and participating. Thank you, by the way, for people using our little archetypes and stuff in discussing the fights after the fact. People talked about Grosso in that Musasi Masvidal mold. That was super cool to see because that's a thing that we talk about on this show a lot. So uh, the response to our show has been fantastic. We keep getting new listeners, and we really appreciate it, you guys. It has been really, really fun, and, and we look forward to seeing the show continue to grow. And uh, until next time, if you all came here today for the finer points of face punching, you came to the right place. This has been Heavy Hands.